We're going to start a new series today, and I want to ask God, Lord, as we start this new series and we look at things that Jesus said, may we all come to a deeper understanding of exactly what Jesus was talking about and how these things play out in our lives. So it's in the name of Christ we pray, amen. Again, we're going to start a new series, and you know, I was thinking about this. There's a lot of things that Jesus said that I don't necessarily care for. I'm just being honest. There's a lot of things that I don't really like that he said, a lot of things that I, I don't really think I have a full understanding of what he was talking about, and quite frankly, a lot of them are quite challenging. I mean, they go against my grain. They're like, I don't really want to hear this. So we're going to start and talk about the things I wish that Jesus never said. One of them is this. It comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5. And Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What the heck is he talking about? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was being raised, I remember my mom, my dad, they taught us and, and continually told us, you know, put your best foot forward. Think about all the, the gifts that you've been given, you know, the talents that you have, and, and exercise those talents to the best of your abilities. You know, be something, with your, make something out of your life. Just you know, think positive and be strong and all of these things. My mom would say, nobody likes a party pooper. Anybody ever hear that one? Nobody likes a party pooper. Well, you know, as I started later in life to get serious about my relationship with Christ, I started wondering, I wonder if mom was right or not. Really? I mean, nobody likes a party pooper, and yet I was taught to be everything that I could be. I started to wonder. Mom was saying, find the self-confidence. Dig down deep and be all that you can be. Be as confident as you can with the talents and the resources and the things that God has gifted you with. And yet Jesus here is saying, what? Be lowly. Think lowly of yourself. I don't know. Kind of leaves me in a quandary almost. Here Jesus comes onto the scene we don't know a lot about his early life, but he starts his ministry life out, you know, when he's in his 30s, and, and he, one of the first times that he addresses the world, you know, for centuries to come, here he is, you know, there's only so many times we have recorded what Jesus has said, and, and this one of these first times Jesus is standing there on the side of the mountain, I want you to picture the scene. There's, there's a lot of people there, and there's, you know, probably the kids have been hushed, and everybody's anticipating and trying to figure out, what is this prophet? What is this man of God? What is this unusual individual, this guy that's different than the rest? What is he going to say? And he starts off, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You know, I thought about those words, and I'm like, really? Blessed are the party poopers. <laughs> Blessed are the losers. You know? Think about it. Is that what he's saying? If blessed means happy, is he saying happy are the unhappy? Is he saying happy are the losers again? I don't know. You see what Jesus is referring to that they missed. But he was talking about their, their own spiritual discernment of who they are before God. He was talking about their own personal discernment of where they were spiritually in their walk with God. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about they needed to have a deeper understanding of who they were before a holy and perfect God. They needed to understand their own sinful nature to a deeper degree. They needed to understand their fallen state. 
They needed to understand, blessed are you when you understand that you are fallen before this holy and perfect God. That's what he meant. You know, today we focus so much on receiving what God can do for us, what our relationship with Jesus is going to do for me, how I'm going to be blessed when I accept Jesus and, and all the things that he offers to us, all the things that the Bible tells us about, all these riches and blessings in the kingdom and in the Garden of Eden and all these things that I'm going to get. We focus on that so much. Many times we, we do a self-assessment on ourselves and we look at ourselves and say, this is who I am. Really what we need to do, Jesus was saying, was you need to have a, a divine assessment of who you are. You need to quit worrying about who you think you are and start worrying more about who God says you are. Really. Because we all have a tendency to elevate ourselves. We have a tendency to think highly of ourselves. Jesus is saying, when you do that, you get yourselves in trouble. Blessed are you if you realize your own depravity before a holy and perfect God. That's what he was saying. You see, the deeper your spiritual relationship is, then the deeper your understanding of your need for him will be. Let me say that again. The deeper your spiritual relationship or your spiritual walk is with God, the deeper you will understand how much you really need him. Now, we've had a lot of examples, great examples of faith over the years and centuries. And when you look at their lives, I kind of found this common theme that ran through a lot of their lives is they didn't, they end, they didn't end up elevating themselves and, and touting their great uh, spirituality at the end of their lives. No, most of these spiritual greats, they ended up mourning at the end of their lives over their great depravity before a holy and perfect God. You see, the, the more they grew in this spiritual awareness of who they are, the more they grew in their, their relationship with God, the more they understood their desperate need for him. Again, that's what Jesus was talking about. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the ones that understand their need for God. You know, this was one of the problems of religious leaders at Jesus' day. They had. They felt so self-assured. They felt so confident in their own relationships with God that they, you know, they, they looked at Jesus and, and sneered at him and turned away from him when, when God was standing there right before him. And they didn't want to look at their own depravity. Anybody ever heard of a a book or a letter that was written called The Imitation of Christ. May you ever heard of that one? It was written by a, uh, an author back in the 1300s, Thomas Kempis. And he was a very religious man, a very devout man. But Thomas Kempis wrote these words. He said, a good man always finds enough over which to mourn and weep. Again, a good man always finds enough over which to mourn and weep. However, he continues. And he said, the closer he examines himself, the more he grieves. The more he examines himself, the more he grieves. You see, he's referring again to a spiritual awareness of, of the nature of humankind, the very nature of each and every one of us. You see, we can't stand up we can't offer enough to a holy God. We can't be good enough. We can't, I don't care how good you are, how famous you are, how much money you got, how, how well you've lived life. It doesn't make any difference is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, blessed are you when you understand, when you understand your need for God and for the salvation that, that comes your way through the cross. That's when you're blessed. That's when you've got a lot to write home about. What about King David? We all know about old King David, right? The guy, the guy screwed up more than I have, you know? <laughs> well, maybe not, I don't know. I mean, he, he did, King David did a lot of stuff that was wrong. 
However, we read that he was a man after God's own heart. Well, how does that work? King David, when he was writing the Psalms, in Psalm 19, he asked God in that Psalm to not only keep him from his willful sins, but also to open his eyes to his hidden faults. Again, he was talking about this spiritual discernment of just who I really am. Make me aware of that, O oh God. Help me, God, to understand who I really am before you. In a way, he's kind of asking God, let me see a little bit more of who you are so that I can compare that to who I am. And in the process, see that, you know what? I guess I'm not as cool as I really thought I am. I'm not all that, you know what I mean? Sometimes, though, we become self-righteous. We build ourselves up. We think we're pretty cool. We think we're pretty, you know, we've got it all together. My life's pretty good. My, you know, my walk with God, yes, yeah, me and you, Lord, we'll straighten this world out. Don't worry about it. That's called being self-righteous. It is, it's not spiritually healthy either. And this was one of the problems that, again, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, one of their main deficiencies was their own self-righteousness. They didn't want to know how they compared to this God that had created all of the world and all of life. They didn't want to understand their constant need for God's grace in their life. Let me tell you what, you, you show me a genuine believer, a genuine believer, someone that has walked with God, humbly with God for the last 50 years of their life, and I'll show you a person that is deeply aware of their spiritual poverty and their constant need for God's grace in their life. I mean that with all my heart. You show me the person that has walked with God, walked with Christ, opening themselves up to whatever God would show you, and I'll tell you, that person is a person that understands the depth of who they are. You have to do that. You have to have that type of spiritual awareness as a prerequisite for any healthy relationship you're going to have with God. It's that simple. You can't go to God and have a relationship with him thinking you're all that. It doesn't work. And too many people today do that because the world and everything around us, around us tells us that we are special, that we are everything, that we can do everything we want to do. We are so powerful, so smart, and so everything. You have to walk humbly with God, it says. Anybody here ever heard of a guy by the name of Martin Luther? Oh, Martin Luther, what a rebel. Guy from back in the 1400s, he was a professor of theology, he was a priest, he was a monk, a composer. Uh, he was one of the major players in the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation is when the Protestant movement kind of broke away from the Catholic Church. One of the things that Martin Luther was, a, was against was the Catholic Church's uh, position on a thing called indulgences. Anybody know what an indulgence is? Well, let me explain it to you. When you were sinful and you acknowledged that sin and you wanted to be forgiven, the church was teaching back then that as a way of showing how much you, you wanted to be forgiven, how sorry you were for your sins, then you would pay a fee to the church. And the more sorry you were, the bigger that fee was, baby. Okay? And Martin Luther said, you know what? You can't be forgiven. Uh, it has nothing to do with money whatsoever, and he was totally against that concept. You see, the offer, the offer of free uh, and complete forgiveness from God was being tainted by that, that, that giving of money, and Martin Luther, that was just one of the things that he was rebelling against. One of the interesting parts about this, this player, Martin Luther, was he spent a lot of time referring to himself as, quote, a stinking sinner. 
This monk, this priest, this writer, this theologian referred to himself constantly as simply a stinking sinner. So much so that many of the religious leaders of that day, they promoted the fact that Martin Luther was possessed by a demon because he was a stinking sinner. You see, Martin Luther was simply aware that no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't fess up. He couldn't measure up to, to, to God. He was, quote, a stinking sinner. You know what? One of the hardest things that we have in life is when you're good at something, when you're really good at something, and everything seems to be going your way, it's hard to remain poor in spirit. Watch this. Anybody here into skateboarding? Huh? All of you, right? Come on, guys. I want everybody out at Dick's Sports today getting skateboards, and let's get ourselves going here. Skateboarding is one of those things that over the past, what, 15, 20 years has become very popular, and you see these skate parks and things all over the place. And as you can see here, some of these guys are phenomenal at what they can do. It's amazing. And they become known as really the best of the best. It's hard to remain humble when you're really, really good at something, though. Show me a genuine believer who has walked with Christ for only one year, and I'll show you a person that is deeply aware of his spiritual poverty and his need for constant grace. Ryan Reese is a good modern-day example of a person that discovered his spiritual depravity. In God's unusual way of doing things, he reached into this guy's life who was living the dream, living the highlight. I mean, he had it all. He was a superstar. And brought this guy down to this point to where he saw who he was before God. As we come to the table this morning, again, my hope and prayer is that each one of us can commune with God for a few moments talking about our own need for who he is in our life. You see, we're not all that. We can be as successful and as wonderful and feel as great as we can, but unless we come to this table and say, God, I need you, I need you flat out, then it's worthless. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I hope that that has new meaning today for all of us. Jesus simply wants us to realize who we are so that we can enjoy that relationship with him. That's all.